Hi, and welcome back to this video in the Biological Psychology video course. And in this video, video 6.3, we're going to take a look at consciousness. Now, so what is consciousness? Consciousness is a very difficult uh, concept to define. We all have some subjective idea of what we mean with the term consciousness, but coming up with a satisfactory definition is very tricky. And I think uh, the best people have been able to come up with comes from an essay by Thomas Nagel in which he asked the question what it is like to be a bat and I think the best we can say is that consciousness is the what it is like aspect of thought it refers to some kind of first person perspective that we have on the world now, it's very hard to define and it is certainly subjective however we define it consciousness is inherently subjective which makes it the most difficult topic to study uh, neuroscientifically or psychologically in a sense, consciousness is often phrased as the result of attention. So attention would be a selection process. And then uh, consciousness would be the result of this selection process. So we are conscious of the things that we attend to. And in that sense, attention and consciousness are not the same, but they are certainly related. And as a working definition, uh, because it is so difficult to measure consciousness, in most experiments studying consciousness, and we will also see that later in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this video, we say that we are conscious of something if we are able to verbally report it. But that, is, that, that works to some extent, but it is very fraught with methodological problems because what we can report depends very strongly on how we can report it. Right? For example, making a verbal report of something may require more consciousness, you could say, than making a button press response, etc., or making an eye movement uh, response. But because we have no other way to objectively say whether you are conscious of something, verbal report or some other form of report is the best that we have in experiments. Now, most, but not all, researchers distinguish attention from consciousness in the sense, what, as I just described, that uh, consciousness is then the, the end product of attention, right? That attention is the selection process and consciousness is the result of that selection process. Um, and they are certainly related. So I would say even, uh, even uh, researchers who distinguish attention from consciousness acknowledge that they are very related concepts. Because, and I would say, we are generally, uh, we need to be to pay attention to something to be conscious of it right so an example of that is for example the the, the very famous uh, uh, change blindness experiments in which uh, for example a picture of a, a picture of some kind of visual scene flashes and then with every uh, with every flash something changes in the picture and then what you find is that generally you don't detect the change until you're attending to it right so you really need to attend to the thing that changes in order to be conscious of that thing and in order to detect the change um, a very important distinction that is often made in, in uh, research on consciousness, especially by philosophers, is that between the easy and the hard problem of consciousness. And that was proposed, or that, that, that was first done by Dave Chalmers, the kind of uh, uh, hippie philosopher that you see on the right there. Now, and the easy problem of consciousness is basically the question, what do neurons do when we are conscious? Right? This is uh, a practical problem. In principle, we could find out what neurons do when we are conscious of something. It is a difficult question um, because we don't have that level of neuroscientific insight yet, but it is, a, it is a question that I think it is conceivable that at some point we are able to answer it, right? We have some idea of where to start. So in that sense, it is an easy problem, although I think easy, it is only easy uh, relative to the hard problem. Now, so the hard problem is the question of how it is possible that the brain or any other material for that matter, also for example, a computer, an artificial brain, can have some first person insight. How it is possible that we have some subjective experience, that there is something it is like for us to be us. And this is a hard problem because we don't have any idea where even to begin answering this question, right? It is not, it may be an unanswerable question. We don't know. If it is an answerable question, then at least with the current knowledge that we have, it seems unanswerable. But I'm an optimist and I hope maybe at some point in the future we will be able to answer the hard question, but the hard problem. But for now, I think uh, even the easy problem is already, uh, is already quite challenging. Now, um, another important 
thought experiment that you often hear of when we're talking about consciousness is the Chinese room experiment proposed by John Searle. Now, I, personally, I'm, I don't really like this thought experiment very much. I think it is a little bit misleading and actually quite shallow in its, in its thinking. But because it is so uh, famous, I think it's important to be aware of it. And the, John Searle proposes the following situation. He says, imagine a non-Chinese speaking person in a room. When that person receives a line of Chinese text, written text, right? So he receives a note of text. That person, she, looks up the correct Chinese response according to the rules in the manual and then returns this response as written text, right? So the person in that room receives a note of text, uh, has no idea what the note says, but then goes to a manual and based on the rules in that manual says, okay, if, if I see this character, I have to respond in such and such way, etc. And then after probably <laughs> extensively consulting that manual, the person comes up with a, with a response a line of Chinese characters, and she has no idea what they mean, but basically returns them to the person outside of the room. Now, in that sense, if you're outside of the room, and you can, then you can communicate with the room, right, by giving notes to the person in the room and receiving notes uh, back. So from the outside, these responses seem to seem sensible, and they suggest some, some level of consciousness, right? Now, and the question that John Searle then asks is, is the man in the Chinese, or the woman in this case, in the Chinese room, or the room itself, consciously speaking Chinese? So is there someone conscious? Is there some conscious uh, processing going on in, in Chinese, in this Chinese room? And his, his answer to that question is no, right? That in this case, it shows that something, namely the Chinese room, can act as though it is conscious, but in this case, he says, clearly, there is no, nothing and no one that is actually understanding Chinese in this room. So, so essentially, uh, what I'm demonstrating in this thought experiment is that something can behave as though it is conscious without any actual consciousness taking place. That's his point. I think it's a very shallow point, to be honest. I think what the, the most profound answer that you can give to this question is that, A, it's an impossible situation because there is no such manual. But even if we assume that there is a magical manual that allows you to, to translate arbitrary Chinese to an arbitrary Chinese answer, then what you would have effectively is a room that as an entity, as a whole, is conscious, right? And so the room with the person in it, with the manual in it, etc., together as an entity would be a conscious Chinese being in that sense, right? So I think, to me, that is the most sensible answer that you can give to this thought experiment. But I think it's important to be aware of it because you will hear quite often references to the Chinese room experiment when people are talking about consciousness. So there are various, various states of consciousness. So let's, let's get from the, from the philosophy and go a little bit back to the neurobiology, where we have much more to say about consciousness. So consciousness is a continuum, right? There are, you can be alert and wakeful, in which case you are maximally conscious, I would say. You can be kind of drowsy, in which case your consciousness is a bit reduced. You can be drunken, drunk, in which case maybe your consciousness is not reduced as such, but it, actually, it is altered, it is at least different. You can be asleep, in which case you may be conscious, maybe not, but it's certainly a different form of consciousness. You can hibernate, right? Some animals hibernate. Uh, hibernation is certainly not death. It's also not quite sleep. It's related to sleep, of course. But what happens to, what happens to consciousness in hibernation is, as far as I know, unknown. You can be in a coma, in which case consciousness is presumably absent or, or much reduced. And you can even be death. Dead, right? Death is a state of absent consciousness, you could say, right? So consciousness is not one thing that, it, not an all or nothing thing, but it is something that can exist in various, uh, to various degrees and also in various forms. Uh, that we do not have many real theories of consciousness, I would say, but Bernard Bars is one of the main uh, consciousness researchers, and he proposed a global workspace theory that I think is, is, it does certainly not explain all aspects of consciousness, but at least it explains some aspects, and that I think is already quite good. Now, the idea of the global workspace theory, and I should say, it was also developed quite a lot by uh, Stan de Haan in, in Paris, uh, and according to the global workspace theory, consciousness occurs when different brain areas form coalitions. That's, what, that's the way they describe it. Now, and that these coalitions communicate to rep represent one thought, one sensation, etc. That sounds a bit vague, but to make it a bit more uh, concrete, think about it this way. So 
say, for example, that you see a car somewhere in the distance, right? That car gives you visual input. So your visual brain areas start representing that car. That car also makes a sound. So your, your auditory cortex start repre starts representing that car, the sound that the car makes. But as long as you're not conscious of the car, that sensation of that visual sensation and that auditory sensation is not linked. And as soon as you become conscious of the car, then essentially we get a global workspace. We get a coalition of brain networks that together start to represent the auditory aspect of the car, the visual aspect of the car in one coherent whole. So the different parts of the brain start working together, start forming coalitions to represent that car. And according to uh, Bernard Baars and, and Stan de Hane, that that is what happens when uh, when when you become conscious of something and i think that makes a lot of sense i think to some extent that's probably true even though of course it leaves a lot of aspects of consciousness unexplained now the global workspace theory has supported uh, received some support from brain research and i want to take a look at in a bit more detail at a study recently published by salty and colleagues from actually stan de Haan's lab who used blind sight to study consciousness now, so in blind sight is the phenomenon that people can report something quite accurately while they feel that they're actually not consciously aware of it. And it's mostly used, the term blind sight is mostly used, used in the context of people with brain damage, people who have damage to their visual cortex, in some cases claim that they, they are blind, that they cannot see anything, right? So they, they have no visual awareness, but they are nevertheless able to, to perform some visually guided actions. And they're nevertheless able to, for example, guess above choice, above chance, where something is in front of them, right? So they have, clearly they have some function, some visual functions are remaining, but there is no visual awareness Accompany, accompanying those visual functions. And then it's called blind sight. Now, you can also induce something that vaguely resembles blind sight in, uh, in healthy uh, participants, which is what Salty and colleagues did. So here's what they did. I'll walk you through the experiment. So um, this is a trial of the experiment. So they started with the fixation dot and then a target appeared. And the target was this, uh, this line segment here. Target was presented very, very briefly, 33 milliseconds, and then masked by these crosses. And then uh, there was a retention interval, and then participants had to say two things. Either did you see a target or not, right? So for 33 milliseconds, that, that is very short. So in many cases, participants will not consciously perceive the target, right? It will be masked by these crosses so quickly that you simply miss it. You don't see it. So then you would say not seen, whereas if you would see it, you would say, okay, I saw it, right? So, and they use this as a, this report uh, as a measure of whether participants were consciously aware of the target or not. And then as a second task, participants had to indicate where the target was, right? And even if they say, said, okay, I didn't see the target, they still had to report where it was, um, which is a bit of a counterintuitive uh, thing to do for the participants, right? If you, if you, as a participant, you think I didn't see anything, then the question, where was the thing that you didn't see doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense, but we will see that participants are actually able to do that above chance. So in here, in, in part B, we have the performance of the participants. So on the trials where participants said that they saw the target, you see that the red diagonal of this, this map is quite red, meaning that uh, if the, the target was at location one, then the reported location was almost always one. And if it was at location eight, the reported location was almost always location eight, right? So participants correctly reported where the target was. Uh, now, what you see is that even on trials where participants didn't see the target, there is still a diagonal clearly present. In other words, even if participants didn't see, claim that they didn't see the target, if the, part, if the target was at position one, then they reported still above chance that the target was at position one. Right? In other words, even if participants were unable to report the target, claimed that they were unaware of the target, they were still able to report its location above chance. In other words, they exhibited a form of blindsight. Now, and then Salty and colleagues measured electrical brain activity with EEG, which is a way to measure uh, electrical activity of the brain, and MEG, which is a way to uh, measure mag magnetic activity, essentially a different way to measure electric activity of the brain. Now, and what they found was that if participants claimed that they didn't see a stimulus and also misreported the location of the stimulus, that the target was only very briefly represented in the brain. In other words, you can see this here at the bottom. And what you see here is essentially sort of a, you could see, you could say the brain activity that corresponds to the presentation of the target. 
Now, and the more yellowish reddish colors uh, uh, correspond to, to more stronger representation of that target. In other words, what you see is that if it was unseen and incorrectly reported, there was some representation of the target, but it was quite weak, right? Now, if participants claimed that they did not see the target, but they did report the cor cor location correctly, so the unseen correct trials, you see that there is the heat map is hotter, essentially. So the, the, the target is represented more strongly and also across, but you cannot see that in this figure, but across a wider range of brain areas. So there seemed to be more of a global workspace going on in that case. And if participants saw the target and correctly reported it, then the representation was even stronger, right? So there was a gradual, you could say a gradual level of representation. If participants claimed they didn't see the target and also did not correctly report where it was, the target clearly did, was not very well represent, represented in their brain. If they claimed that they didn't see it, but they did report the location correctly, the representation was stronger. And if they just claimed that they saw it, so they were aware of it and reported it correctly, the representation was strongest, at all, uh, strongest of all. Now, what does this show? I think it is somewhat, somewhat in line with the idea of a global workspace. It also suggests that consciousness is gradual, right? That stimuli can be almost seen. So if you claim that you didn't see a stimulus, but you nevertheless report its location correctly, what happens is that that stimulus was on the, on the brink of being consciously perceived. Um, but it's just that the global workspace can, be, can exist to a stronger or a weaker extent, right? There can be the coalitions in your, in your brain that, that correspond to consciousness can be stronger or looser depending on how, consciousness essential, how conscious you are of something. I think that's what it shows, right? And it also shows, I think, that uh, there is not really a qualitative difference between consciousness and non-consciousness, but that consciousness is really a gradual process that you can have to, uh, to different extents. Now, with that, let's move on to the next video, video 6.4, in which we're going to take a look at sleep and dreams.